morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I am Kim McCleary, President and CEO. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to today's program. I want to thank all of you for your ongoing support and viewership that has sustained us during these challenging times. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's program. Protest and repression around the globe, a roundtable discussion on Hong Kong, Thailand, Russia, and Belarus. The panelists include Natalia Chernyshova, Senior Lecturer in Modern History at the University of Winchester, who will discuss Belarus. Nina Khrushcheva, Professor in the Julian J. Studley Graduate Programs of International Affairs at the New School, who will discuss Russia. Claudio Sopranzetti, Assistant Professor in Anthropology at Central European University, who will discuss Thailand. Jeffrey Wasserstrom, Chancellor's Professor of History, UC Irvine, who will discuss Hong Kong. The conversation will be led by Maria Repnikova, Assistant Professor in Global Communication at Georgia State University. I would also like to thank our event partners, the University of California Irvine Forum for the Academy and the Public, Venda Museum, Central European University Democracy Institute, Orange County World Affairs Council, and the Index on Censorship. Maria, we are so glad that you are able to moderate today's program for this very important discussion. I'd love to bring you on now with our terrific panelists and turn the program over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for this introduction and for joining us for this really important event. It's a real pleasure um, to moderate this panel on protests and repression under authoritarian rule. In the past two years, we have witnessed a large scale protest movement um, around the globe, including in countries that rarely see or allow for national level demonstrations, including in Thailand, Belarus, um, Russia, and in some parts of the world like Hong Kong and now also Myanmar, we see a reversal into more authoritarianism and protest movements trying to preclude this uh, from happening and in favor of maintaining more autonomy. These protests often hit us by surprise. They energize and inspire us, but also at times disappoint us, as these movements don't always produce the anticipated outcomes of political change. Today, we have a group of distinguished panelists that you have already met, been introduced to, that will help us understand why and how protests materialize in repressive contexts and what the results, what kind of results they bring about. Uh, we're going to go in the order of the program, starting with Natalia and then moving to uh, Nina, Claudio, and Jeff, and they will each introduce um, this topic in their respective context. We're going to discuss this in three ways. There are going to be three questions that I'll be posing to our panelists, starting with the what question or why those protests actually materialize. What are those individuals, those groups protesting about? And then moving on to the how, the techniques, the distinctive and sometimes unique techniques that these groups uh, deploy in, um, in this protest movement. And concluding with a so what? Why does this matter? Do they actually bring about any change? And how do we think about change as a result of protest um, under autocracy? So we're going to start with the what question. Um, what is happening? So that each one of our panelists will introduce their context and we'll start with Natalia uh, Chernyshova who will talk about Belarus. Thank you so much. Maria, Maria, if I can interrupt, it looks like your webcam is not on. If you can go ahead and turn that on so we can see you, we'd appreciate it. Thank you, there you are. Right, well, um, thank you very much uh, for this introduction, Maria and Kim. Um, and um, to our hosts and organizers uh, for putting this panel together, um, which is a really um, interesting idea. Now, um, the protests in Belarus um, have several layers, if you like, in terms of their goals and what they're trying to achieve. Uh, they are about removing, on, on a very primary level, about removing the country's authoritarian president, Lukashenko, and ending his 27-year-long grip on the country. Um, 
it's about gaining meaningful electoral choice um, in a very basic sense. Um, Lukashenko came to power in 1994 in Belarus' first and only uh, democratic elections, and he has claimed to have won all elections um, ever since, despite allegations of, of uh, fraud uh, being present at every election. Um, and so winning these 2020 elections in August um, um, would have given him the sixth term in power and, and another five years in post as president. Uh, but when the commission announced their uh, official results of, of the vote, giving Lukashenko another sweeping victory, um, the country erupted in protest. And these protests were un unprecedented. Um, and the protesters who came out in those first days of the um, um, uh, 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 in the first days after the elections, they um, uh, came out to register their, res their, their outrage at um, the results which they considered blatant lies. Um, the popularity of Lukashenko's main opponent um, in the presidential race, Svetlana Tikhanovska, had been so visible, so apparent, um, that they saw these uh, results, uh, which gave her just 10% of the vote as, as offensive and implausible. Uh, one protester described these as, as a spit in the face. Now, many Belarusians backed Tikhanovska, um, not necessarily because they wanted her to be uh, a president, but because her victory would mean the end of Lukashenko in power. Um, Tikhanovska was a complete political novice at the time. Um, she ran in place of her jailed husband, who was also not a politician, but a blogger. And um, her political program consisted of nothing more but uh, a promise to hold free, unfettered democratic presidential elections um, after she uh, won if she won. So she didn't have any plans to become president. She didn't have a program. Um, her sole declared goal was to clear the path for democratic election. And this is what a lot of the protesters wanted and do want still um, electoral uh, choice, meaningful electoral choice and change. Now, Pester's endorsement of Tikhanovska helps explain why Lukashenko is no longer a desirable, not even a tolerable option for uh, so many people. Um, she's a blogger's wife, Tikhanovska. Um, she it comes from a small town, but she is well educated. She speaks English. She's quite urbane in her sort of outlook and manner and, and of course, her views. Um, she has a digitally savvy team uh, who have conducted a very effective uh, online vote as an alternative to the official count. And all this clashed really badly with uh, Lukashenko's electoral campaign, which consisted mainly of touring collective farms and telling farmers in a rather patronizing uh, way that, you know, harvesting bread is more important than voting in some silly elections. Uh, and this may have been a persuasive tactic some years ago, but it no longer is, because Belarusian society has changed in important ways. Um, and Lukashenko's electoral campaign showed that he had not really got this in, and I'm not, I don't believe he's capable of catching up. Um, his statements and his kind of strategy is very much at odds with society, and as just one example of how uh, the clash uh, manifests itself is that Belarusian society is a highly digitally literate one, um, and Lukashenko really doesn't have a clue about you know, things, such mysterious things as smartphones or or um, online social media. You know, his social media presence is is virtually negligent. He had to learn the hard way about the um, power of social media, uh, you know, Telegram channels that were uh, crucial in organizing mass demonstrations in Belarus. Um, in um, uh, publicizing the images of, of police brutality and violence, um, which were also very important, as I'll explain. Um, Belarusians are well-traveled. This is overwhelmingly an urban society. 79% uh, of the population live in towns and cities. Uh, and Lukashenko seems just very firmly stuck in his um, village origins. He, he talks uh, this way. He constructs his own image in that fashion, uh, as if the majority of his voters are uh, or think like peasants, um, and the truth is they do not. So on a basic but important level, uh, the protests are about the outdated dictator who's been in power for far too long and um, lost touch with society that he seeks to control. Now, secondly, and most prof more profoundly perhaps, um, the protests are driven by the desire to shed the system that has failed. Um, and that system also is closely associated with Lukashenko personally. 
he had traditionally staked his legitimacy on a promise to um, preserve and build the best legacy uh, of the Soviet times. Um, and to many, it had seemed an attractive uh, promise um, in the 90s and, and beyond, um, because indeed the late Soviet decades had something to offer in terms of economic and social rewards. But in reality, Lukashenko has failed um, to capitalize effectively on those gains or to prevent economic decay and uncertainty. And in recent years, this has become particularly um, evident, uh, increasingly evident that it was thrown in a particularly painful, um, sharp relief um, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Lukashenko infamously we responded. To, we need to move on to uh, Russia. It's, it's, I think you gave a wonderful overview. We'll get back to you in a moment about the tactics and learn more about social media and how protesters managed to mobilize in such a repressive context. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Professor Nina Khrushcheva next, and she'll talk about Russia and recent movements um, with regards to Navalny or anything else that she wants to introduce to us. Thank you so much. I think you're muted, Nina. You may need to unmute. Okay. Here we go. Thank you. Now I'm fine. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I am actually going to follow up right on Belarus uh, because Svetlana Tikhanovskaya said it better than anybody. She said that Belarus has a revolution and Russia has protests. And I think that really encompasses it very, very well because the protests in Russia are more than anything is about Putin fatigue. It has been around for 20 years. And Navalny, Alexei Navalny, the opposition leader, is a symbol of that um, because basically Putin now after 20 years presents uh, represents an ossified system and that's what protests are aiming at sort of more political agility uh, freedom to choose uh, and uh, um, kind of more room to maneuver in uh, maneuver in the political terms a little bit of context uh, so the protest activity increase since um, 2018 when Putin won or whatever got elected or um, got the elections I guess that's the better way of putting it uh, and uh, it was about 70 percent I'm sure they read the elections a bit but probably got 65 percent honest and so they considered it a um, um, kind of they misread it as a matter of trust uh, promised not to uh, reform the pension system, ultimately or very quickly did this, and thus very much insulted the population. And so that's when the local protests all over Russia started reappearing, but they were on all sorts of issues. It could be garbage, it could be governors, it could be pensions, it could be uh, it could be anything. But what's also important is that Putin's disapproval went up 35, uh, about 34, 35 percent, which is a lot of disapproval. I'm not talking about approval because in Russia, approval doesn't matter that much. It's always going to be around 60 uh, and, and up. So uh, with Navalny, I think what's important is that um, when Navalny came back, you know, he was poisoned in the summer, went to Germany uh, to recuperate, uh, was um, um, asked to return, not to return, returned in January. Uh, and then when the protests uh, really uh, went up in earnest, but what's important that unlike the protests uh, from, from since 2018, it was just one subject. The subject was Putin is a thief, uh, free Navalny, free Russia. Um, and um, that was uh, really a big change. This one not, I mean, I know in a lot of Western press, it says they were the largest protests. They were not the largest protests but they were probably the, the most organized in a sense it was one subject. So it's all about the Putin fatigue. Um, so in some ways, Navalny did represent a Russian hero type. So, you know, in, in America, we have Captain America. So he's sort of a Captain Russia who returned to Russia to be a hero. And that's what people kind of went to uh, witness to celebrate uh, for many, it was a pastime, but we'll talk about it later. But generally, I think it's important to note that uh, Navalny is not a unifying figure, and that's why those protests go up and down, precisely because um, he 
um, is a symbol of being against the Putin system, but it's really the protest, a lot of it is not in the support of his own political potential. So I guess I'll just stop at that. Thank you so much, Nina. We're now moving to a completely different context to Thailand, and I invite Claudia to give some remarks about why the protests have erupted, in particular, the protests challenging the monarchy, which has been really it caught us all by surprise. So we look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, it, it kind of caught also many of us observers by surprise in a way, or not by surprise, but at least um, with a sense of awe, actually, of the defiance of fear um, that a kind of new generation of, of protesters are bringing to this. Now, just to build a little bit on what um, Natalia and Nina were talking about, I mean, here is a sm slightly different context in the sense that it's a context in which you don't have really a leader of the opposition. So it's in no way uh, we can understand this protest of being like an opposite side that recognizing a man or a woman as a symbol for them. Um, these are protests that emerged um, in early or mid to 2020 um, out of initially a constitutional reform. Um, so Thailand had a coup in 2014 when the military, military uh, took power. This is very common in Thailand. It's happened 17 times since 1932. Um, so it's not, you know, we, we're, we're used to coup. Um, but they came in and what they did this time slightly different is that they passed a new constitution, which coup always do. But they uh, kind of built a constitution in which the parliament was tilted to be in their favor, regardless of the election of following um, um, election results. So you have um, basically half of the parliament is appointed and half of the parliament was voted. So the military will continue to win election regardless kind of popular support. And so the protest developed initially as a way to reform this constitution, to ask for constitutional change, and then very quickly transform um, into a much larger challenge to the power of the monarchy in Thailand. A challenge that it's not uncommon if you're used to be among activists in Thailand that you could hear you know, in living room and late night discussion, but not a challenge you heard in main squares, not a challenge you, you heard uh, on national television or on newspapers. And so in some sense, what happened is that a long history of protests for democratization in Thailand, which have happened over and over again over the course of the last 50 and 60 years, have really taken at the monarchy as the core of their demand, a reform of the monarchy, economic power, political power, uh, role in the country, um, everyday practices, mode of life, and so on and so forth. And what has happened since, which I think happened in all of the cases that we're looking at, is that those kind of mass protests operate as magnet. So they kind of attract all sorts of demand and all sorts of um, popular activities around them. So the LGBT community, uh, the educational reform questions, um, question about economic transformation, decentralization, kind of added one onto the other. And so in some ways, I think they became, and that why people at risk of their life are coming into the street, is that they became um, a sort of array of what is imaginable, not necessarily what is possible to obtain, uh, but what is possible to imagine as an alternative future for Thailand. It's really what is going on in the streets, I think, now. Thank you so much for this fascinating introduction. Uh, we're moving yet to our last context, but not least, uh, is uh, Professor Jeff Wasserstrom. He's going to talk about Hong Kong, and that's a city that many of us have been to and love dearly, and Jeff has written widely about this. So please tell us what's been happening in Hong Kong, and is there hope for this resistance to continue? Thank you. So thinking about these four contexts, um, and I've learned so much from the fellow panelists of this, if we went back in time, just a couple of years, we would have said that Hong Kong was the place with the most space for protest, the most possibility for people to take to the streets, to take the least risk actually to be on the streets. So it's really dramatic that here in 2021, Hong Kong has become a place where taking to the streets is incredibly risky, um, where the government hasn't been giving permission, legal permission for protest. So just kind of spinning back and also this idea of, of surprise, um, in 2019, uh, there were protests, and there were protests every year going up to that from 2014 quite regularly. And the protests were about different specific issues, but all of them to some extent were about 
trying to hold the line against what was called in Hong Kong sometimes mainlandization, efforts to make Hong Kong, to remake Hong Kong more like um, the cities across the border from it on the mainland in what the Chinese Communist Party now wants to envision uh, as a greater Bay Area, a kind of place like the American Bay Area, where you know that Oakland and San Francisco are different and Silicon Valley are different places, but you're not keenly aware of moving from one to the other. Until recently, you were keenly aware when you got to Hong Kong of all kinds of ways that things were different. Uh, there were legal protests. Every year on the anniversary of the June 4th massacre of 1989, there was a big vigil in Hong Kong and there wasn't in any mainland city. In nearby Macau, things were a little bit uh, special and there was room for some protest, but there wasn't much protest. Um, and so there have been moves by the Hong Kong local government that are in league with uh, the chief executive who is in a sense handpicked through um, procedures in a way that has to be somebody who will um, go along with much that goes from Beijing, but also increasingly with direct moves from Beijing there have been efforts to minimize the kind of differences between uh, political and civil life in Hong Kong. And this has taken um, various, there have been various steps to minimize the difference, which is a different uh, strat system of rule of law. There's never been democracy in Hong Kong, but there were more democratic forms. There was more space for public debate in Hong Kong. And the protests have been whenever that seems to be eroding or chipped away at. And people in 2019 took to the streets feeling it was a kind of last ditch effort to protect the difference rule of law, the different kind of degree of democracy. And the protests were the biggest the city had ever seen. In some ways, some of the biggest the world has ever seen if we think of percentage of a population on the streets. In the largest protests in 2019, um, estimates were of a million to 2 million people on the streets of a territory of 7.5 million. And that's just incredible um, proportion wise. The movement was never completely unified, but it was unified uh, around the theme, which often unifies protests around the world, including in this country, which was protest against the means being used to stop protests. So the protest began about a specific law that would have allowed um, extradition to the mainland um, for a trial in a less free court system for some people who, who broke laws, but it quickly became a protest for the right to protest itself and a protest calling for an investigation of police brutality. And there were divisions within the movement, including um, over whether tactics that were purely nonviolent should be used or if some kinds of more militant protests should be used, which were often attacks on property. Um, but there was a, a, a large percentage of the population continued to think that the majority of the violence was coming from the police side and the side of repression. So the movement continued through 2019. And at the end of 2019, there was a count district council election that was won by a landslide of pro-democracy candidates. And the story since then has been um, moves largely by Beijing itself to curtail the possibility for such a thing happening again. Um, there have been moves to suspend elections, there have been disqualifications of people who've won elections, and there have been a refusal to allow um, permission for protests. And now we've, we have resistance. Resistance goes on in Hong Kong, but it's largely taking uh, subtler forms. It's taking more the forms that we're used to in uh, authoritarian states, of subtle forms of mockery, of maintaining solidarity among people who share certain views but there haven't been these large scale actions on the streets. In part, of course, due to COVID, but it's also hard to imagine a scenario in which even once the pandemic is under control, there will be permission for large scale uh, protests again. Um, so now the story has shifted from largely um, a story of resistance to a story of repression and subtler forms of resistance. Thank you so much, Jeff, for this, I guess, somewhat pessimistic account of Hong Kong, but we're gonna get back to the techniques, the subtle techniques in a moment. Uh, I think we're going to shift now to how these protesters continue to mobilize and survive, in some cases even thrive under this really harsh conditions. 
And given that we only have about 20 minutes left, I think um, the two questions, the two final questions can be grouped together. How are these protesters surviving and persisting? And maybe they're shifting and transforming their acts as they are in Hong Kong. And what results do they achieve, if any? And how should we think you know, about change due to protests? What kind of change are we expecting or anticipating? Change of regime, maybe it's change of specific policies, or simply kind of mobilization in and of itself is a change in spirit or some kind of hopeful sign that the society is still thriving despite um, autocracy. So we're going to get back now to Belarus, uh, to Natalia, and she'll tell us about the techniques and, and what's been happening and is there any change? Um, thank you, Maria. You made it sound like I'm going to teach everyone how to protest. No, <laughs> um, but I would like to give some examples. I mean, in a way, similar to what Jeff was saying about Hong Kong and Belarus, the mass kind of demonstrate the demonstrations on, on a mass scale that were making the headlines in August, September, October, they've disappeared. But and, and some have thought that this means the protests have died out. Um, that's not the case. Um, they've shifted. They, they shifted shape. They shifted venues. Um, um, probably uh, in many ways similar to Hong Kong and, and perhaps um, other places. I don't know. Um, but um, I just wanted to to bring some examples of, of these um, different ways to, to protest that have been uh, going on in, in Belarus. And, and they're really, um, you know, a very creative um, and, and art and sense of humor play a, 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 an important role in it, but um, also finding you know, spaces that are uh, uh, unexpected and uh, unusual. Um, and um, some of them involve legal petitions and, and just kind of complaining to the state through official channels uh, en masse and, and flooding the uh, authorities with complaints, for example, about the shutting down of internet, which took place in the immediate days of, after the elections. And I have a few images that I'd like to share to illustrate these um, um, ideas, these um, uh, new ways. I, I, can you see my screen? Um, um, Maybe. So, uh, there we go. Yeah, we can see it now. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, uh, so so we, we have these um, uh, petitions and sometimes they also take place abroad. So uh, Belarusians lobby the organizations who are, um, uh, or, or companies like this, Yara, Norwegian company, um, that ha is one of the most important partners of, of Belarus, Kali, a Belarus, Belarusian company. Um, and, and so through social media, through a uh, uh, website of, of Yara, the um, Belarusians both at home and abroad petition it to, uh, to stop cooperating with the regime because the, the, the message of this one is that you're sponsoring violence, you know, the, the, the money is used to um, suppress demonstrations and uh, protests. Um, and, and some of these campaigns have been very successful, for example, the um, uh, lobbying of the International Ice Hockey Federation, which removed the um, competition um, uh, scheduled for this year from Belarus. Um, small protests also take place daily across the country. Um, they're virtually impossible to stamp out because they're short and uh, unpredictable, but they get wild publicity through telegram channels. Some take place uh, uh, as, a, as a kind of a flash mob pose um, and then get sent, these images get sent to Telegram. Um, others have made small installations. This, for example, is an image uh, in, in the Minsk metro, uh, which addresses the uh, security services saying that when you when we put you in jail, we will treat, treat you like human beings, unlike you treating us. Um, or there was this... Um, installation of shoes which uh, copied the uh, famous uh, memorial to um, uh, to the, the the Jewish residents of Budapest who were killed by the Nazis um, and and uh, the memorial had the um, uh, sort of a selection of shoes um, uh, uh, cast in metal and uh, put on the embankment um, in Budapest as, as a symbol of, of those Jewish victims who were shot and uh, uh, thrown into the river and so in Belarus they've done these um, uh, the shoes <laughs> on display saying that we um, are, are protesting you you're not hearing us and even when we when you can't see us we are protesting um, which I think is a very poignant message um, um, I wanted to show um, um, some of the battles around this opposition flag red white uh, white red and white flag of the opposition um, 
uh, it's illegal to display these flags in your windows in, in your home or, or anywhere in public you can go to prison for that or get fined so people have turned all sorts of everyday items even these snowflakes or christmas cut out of paper into um uh, surrogate flags um in some occasions people have made little boats with um, flags as their sails and and uh, and set them free uh, in a in a park's pond or a river on a frosty morning and um, um, they, they've given a lot of kind of headache to the authorities who had to fish them out um, and sometimes failed um, while all of this was filmed and then posted on Telegram. There were flash mobs of the uh, reading women, women dressed in black, uh, sorry, in, in red, white uh, uh, and white, um, uh, a staging kind of flash mobs, um, readings of uh, books like uh, Belarusian literature or um, Belarusian constitution in public places like Minsk Metro or uh, suburban trains. Uh, some pro protests were um, just single person protests um, like these ones. There were several women seen in, in Minsk, for example, wearing black. Um, and all sorts of other things like, um, you know, um, turning your mobile phones into little um, candles and uh, flashing lights to, to show solidarity. Again, this is something that we've seen in Hong Kong and uh, and elsewhere. Uh, seeing shopping malls, kind of singing flash mobs um, in public places. And a very important one, um, neighborhood parties. And this is something I, I want to particularly stress. This is um, a phenomenon that has been very important in Belarus, this emergence of neighborhood communities um, that sometimes uh, come together of an evening to just be together, but also um, the trappings of the oppositional um, um, symbols and uh, flags and, um, um, uh, you know, music that uh, the authorities perceive as, as uh, connected with opposition and so on. And um, the uh, the truth is that these are important movements, you know, the grassroots uh, movements. Um, they have a lot of potential to become political and the authorities think of them um, as being political uh, and um, and stamp them out. Now, um, uh, people who are in charge of uh, group chats of these neighborhood communities can face um, a jail term and go to prison for several years for just being in charge of these kind of neighborhood communities. So they are seen as, as a very powerful means of protest. I think I'll Salah, step up so now. And, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll move forward to Russia and see if we have any similarities there. And I'll, I'll welcome Nina to tell us a bit about the techniques and results of the protests in Russia. Okay, well, I don't have that much detail um I just speak about a few things well the thing about Pro navalny protests that navalny is a media person i mean he his own media company he produces incredible documentaries so that's how in many ways these things are organized because they are ahead of um uh, ahead of the system ahead of any social media potential even because for example when he released um uh, film documentary about Putin's palace, then of course people went to the streets just because it was such a fun story to go and protest. Not that it was such an incredible surprise that Russian leaders are corrupt. Of course they are and everybody knows that, but it was such an absurd way of putting it, of, of putting it forward. Um, um, so I'm not an expert on techniques, so I'll just be very kind of in layman terms. Um, uh, for example, I think, and Jeff will correct me probably, uh, something that has never happened before, because when you go and to protest before, you could easily communicate on social media and post pictures. You can't do it anymore. It sort of seems like a Hong Kong technique that uh, I think started in Belarus in the summer and then got got to Russia. For example, in the summer, in during the protests right now, you could you couldn't post anything. So you will find out what's happening and things are happening because um, the more protests happen, the more uh city is closed completely it's basically the whole center is shut out so you cannot go to places where you're supposed to be going to protest at the beginning so the telegram channels 
telling you what to do. So Telegram, and I think in Belarus too, it became completely indispensable. Um, I have an American phone, so my phone was jammed immediately because it goes through satellite. So what I was when when I needed to find out where to go, I was finding out from um, wire services because wire services report immediately. So this is one of the techniques you can use. You can actually go to um, RB, uh, RBK, the Russian wire service, or even uh, Reuters on AP and and and, um, and find out. But I think so. If we talk about the um, uh, if we talk about what's uh, what's next and what is the future uh, is um, uh, is a very important thing because um, like Lukashenko, uh, the um, uh, the state really. I mean they're very savvy with social media, but certainly not as savvy as the young people. And so when I was kind of finally find, found out from Telegram, from the te Telegram channel where to go, and I finally got to the protest site, and there was a young man who was being taken away uh, from right where I was standing, and he said, can you post that for me? It's um, either Putin or jail. And so this is something that the future is that these young people are not afraid. They may not know exactly what kind of future they want, but they're certainly ready to um, uh, to take responsibility for it, but also they're ready to try out all sorts of opportunities. And so the last thing I'm going to say is that I don't think Russia does enough protesting. I think Jeff said that in Hong Kong, they're really, you know, a lot of people per square meter. Um, I think that if uh, Russians were going out to protest in millions, even early on in 2012, and Putin returned to presidency, which they did not, I mean, they were mass, but not mass enough. I don't think the state would be treating Russians like, like it does right now, because it's, you know, when you have 750 people coming out, um, or even 7,000 people coming out, it's not the same as 7 million. And Moscow, just Moscow, is 13 million, if not more. Thank you so much, Nina, um, about this really interesting contrast also in terms of scale of protests. Do they matter? It sounds like um, you argue that they really do. So we'll move on to Claudio and your techniques, analysis of techniques and effects. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'll share my screen as well if I can. Let me know if you if you're seeing pictures or if you're screening or if, you, if you're seeing your faces. It's just very small. Maybe you can um, make them bigger. Uh, right now it looks uh, very. But we see not... a small size. It's okay. I'll do without a measure. That's fine. Um, okay. So two things just to to kind of get us started on this conversation. I mean, the first one is that I think in Thailand, in order to understand techniques of protest, we need to kind of understand that it to be a legal framework in which protests happen. And what is specific about the Thai legal framework is the Les Majesty law, which is a law that punishes anybody who criticizes or talks about the monarchy uh, with three to 15 years of jail for each accusation. So now this is obviously like a, a very specific legal uh, framework in which to operate, um, which generates a lot of the I think incredible creativity that Thai um, activists have had in terms of understanding new technique. Um, so what, what has happened just in the last year is that you have these three frameworks, basically the less majesty law, the computer crime and the sedition law being rolled out um, to, to go after mostly leaders of protest, but not exclusively. And so um, the initial move, let's say from last July, last summer, um, was to use popular culture reference as codes to talk about um, the monarchy mostly and different kind of political processes. So some of the images that I wanted to show is that this started with a protest that was Harry Potter theme. And the reason, the reason to choose the Harry Potter theme was basically to talk about Voldemort, which would be the king in this case. So there's a lot of this kind of code using and, and using things like the three finger salutes that you probably have seen in Thailand that is now coming up in, in Myanmar as well. Um, and so for a while there was this kind of using of both Western and Asian pop culture, um, Japanese manga, Hollywood movies as codes on which to talk about the monarchy. Now from September, basically after some a student group came out with these 10 demands of reforming the monarchy and abolishing um, the less majesty law, that conversation has really broke open. And so people started to kind of shift away from this use of code 
and more and more on using kind of traditional mass protest. Now, obviously, social media, telegram signals are central to organizing, um, but I would argue they haven't actually changed the nature of how protests are, are structured. They, they change the modality through which people get connected. Um, those mass protests were responded by repression, repression both through the legal system and to actually police repression. And especially in October, um, we saw something that the Thai government learned from the Hong Kong government, from the Chinese government, which was this use of um, kind of um, tear gas spice water cannon, cannons. Um, and the response of it, once again, was to start using umbrella and then uh, giant inflatable uh, ducks as um, resistance system. Now, the moment umbrella were started to use, it started to circulate among activists. And I'm sorry I can't show image, but maybe later we can do that. Um, a lot of information, a lot of conversation with people in Hong Kong through Telegram groups about the modality of defending yourself physically in that kind of police confrontation. So a lot of the infographic that were done in Hong Kong a year before start being translated into Thai, uh, in Thai and, and circulated. So you have this kind of second umbrella revolution around this object of the umbrella as a symbolic connection, which then started the connection that it's now known as the Milk Tea Alliance, um, which is group of um, inter-Asia activists sharing techniques and modality and, and, and modes of communication between Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Thailand the first, and now Myanmar. Um, and that created something that I think kind of goes in the direction of asking your other question, which is why should we care and what they're obtaining? I think we should care for a number of reasons. We should care, first of all, because they're not isolated events, uh, because they're networked events. And at the beginning of the conversation, before we went online, we kind of shared this, uh, this map that show how much these kind of protests are rising globally over the last 30 years. So we should care because it's a global phenomenon. I think we should care, secondly, because in this specific environment, and Jeff can, I'm sure, will talk, sorry if I stole some of your techniques, but, uh, Jeff, we talk about because it's a is is the birth of the birth the consolidation of a pan pan Asian anti authoritarian front, which does not necessarily look at Western democratic theory as a model, but rather really try to ask the question of what it means to develop an anti authoritarianism which is not representative Western democracy in a place like East Asia, which I think in many ways is one of the questions of the 21st century and therefore we should care. Thirdly, I think we should care because we run the risk sometimes to look at protest and a, equating a success of a protest with a success of a party. And those are very different things. Uh, a party and a political movement in parliament operate through compromise. A protest operate, as I was saying before, by expanding the space of possible. And I think that's what they're doing. They're really expanding the way of possible. They understand that a lot of the things that they're asking for will not be obtained, but it's kind of this game by which you push a wave as far as possible, knowing that it will move back. But the more you have pushed it first, the less is able to move back after. I think that's true in the US, that's true globally with what we're seeing with protests. It's, it's about throwing the, the rock as far away from the status quo so that the conservative forces can push it back too much. Thank you, Claudio. That was a great uh, summary. I think it speaks to all protest movements, probably across different political systems. So finally, we have Jeff, um, last remarks before we enter the Q&A period. Thank you. Great. I just want to pick up on a couple of different things. One is that in Hong Kong, we've seen a move toward having to use coded forms of protest after a period of very overt. It used to be what was different from the mainland than Hong Kong was that on the mainland you had to use coded things like Winnie the Pooh to stand for Xi Jinping, but in Hong Kong itself you could have a direct mocking of him. Um, and so you've moved from being on the streets to more coded forms. But I think to, to kind of wrap up this, I want to bring up the way that we didn't have to, there wasn't so much of a question, why does it matter in 1989 when there were protests across um, both parts of Eurasia uh, against authoritarianism? And it also was very normal then to think that you should have people who worked on Eastern and Central Europe in the same session as people that worked on China. 
And I think that we've lost that sense of that connectedness, but I think it's actually very useful to look back to that period. Um, Hong, Kong, um, Hong Kong's protests were the biggest protests in the PRC, uh, sustained urban protests since 1989. And the Communist Party was very aware of that. And they didn't want to have something like 1989 again after 1989, and they thought they'd come up with a strategy to keep from that. And a lot of their efforts to repress things have been inflected by the shadow of 1989. They've tried very hard to not have a massacre, to not have the kind of single galvanizing photograph the way the Tank Man photograph was. Um, and so I think some ways the world has, while paying a lot of attention to Hong Kong, hasn't been riveted, hasn't thought of it as the story to pay attention to the way that when Tiananmen was happening, it was thought there. So in that way, the Communist Party has been um, somewhat successful. Um, both the Tiananmen, the Tiananmen protests failed to achieve what they set out for. And in some ways, the Hong Kong protests did too. But we, we do think about Tiananmen as bequeathing to the world inspiring kinds of images. And the Hong Kong protests have, I think, in some ways succeeded more in having a ripple effect than Tiananmen did by adding techniques to the kind of global protest repertoire the notion of flexible, not that they were the only place to do this, but a flexible protest, this idea of be like water, the telegram channel things that Nina described. Hong Kong people were adapting and putting new spins on things from other places and coming up with their own ideas that have then um, traveled. And I think toggling between 1989 and the present is really useful. It's useful in a few different ways. It's useful in part because the Hong Kong protesters adapted things from Eastern and Central Europe. They adapted the human chain idea that was brought over from um, the, Baltic, uh, the Baltic way. Uh, they used Lenin walls, which were adapted from um, what had gone up in Prague in the early 1980s, but then they gave their own spin to it by using um, colored post-it notes to decorate the walls. And this is then picked up in Myanmar, and there are ways in which I think the Hong Kong protests have failed, but they've been generative in a sense, um, inspiring that people are continuing to show resistance even as the odds get more and more stacked against them. Um, and even as the Communist Party has used what um, the Washington Post just said was in a sense, everything but the massacre. And that's something that many of the techniques from Tiananmen in repression but just not one key element, which is very important uh, because it does matter when people are killed in large numbers on the streets. It matters that the world's attention sees more dramatic forms of repression in Myanmar, more blunt instruments. But I think it's important to note how much of a decline there has been in the degrees of freedom in Hong Kong. And I think this notion uh, that um, Claudio brought up of uh, the Milk Tea Alliance is another thing that's fascinating to put side by side with the moves across Eastern and Central Europe in 1989. Those movements were different. They were not the same in each place. Romania was not the same as Czechoslovakia. It was important there was a different results in different places. Romania maybe was more like our Myanmar in this kind of case. Other places such as um, Hungary and Czechoslovakia, maybe we can think about places within the Milk Tea Alliance where over time somehow change has been brought and we can keep despair perhaps at bay by realizing that many of the struggles that succeeded in 1989 seemed for decades as if it was impossible that they would succeed. It was not that people were saying, oh, just wait till 1989 and then there'll be a different result than Hungary in 1956, than Prague in 1968 and Bratislava, than Poland in the early 1980s. Before Solidarity won, it went through a period very much like I think Hong Kong's uh, massive protests are going through now. Something that's like, very much like martial law is happening in Hong Kong. And people have gone in Hong Kong are both thinking about these parallels and thinking about things they can borrow from different parts of the world. Other places are looking to Hong Kong. That's one reason it can matter. And in Hong Kong, the last place that they're thinking about a lot that is important to think about it brings in another part of the Milk Tea Alliance, is they're thinking a lot about what happened in Taiwan, that for a very long period, Taiwan was under authoritarian rule. There had been the crushing of protests, um, and there were very slow steps to rebuild spaces for civil society. And after a very long time, 
there was a success there. And so it can be both a source for despair, but also potential for hope in the very long run to think about that. And people in Hong Kong are now talking about living through a period of white terror. That's a term that was used in Taiwan for the repression by the anti-communist nationalist party. And now they're living through something that's repression by a communist party, but they're still calling it white terror rather than red terror, in part as a code to mock the communist party to say, you think that these were the villains in the history of China, but look how much you are doing things that are like the villains in your own textbooks. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's a wonderful conclusion to the remarks and it brings us to the Q&A uh, portion of the program. So uh, I'm going to um, ask Jessica uh, from the LA World Affairs Council to, um, to take the questions and um, we'll see who can answer them. We'll look forward to a dynamic Q&A. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And we have a lot of questions coming in. So if um, our answers can be a little bit shorter, that would be great. So we can get to as many as possible. I know a panel of academics makes that challenging sometimes. Uh, the first question is going to go to Jeff. The law of Hong Kong is unique, being a common law system preserved after the handover to China in 1997 within the civil law system of the People's Republic of China under the principle of one country, two systems. Why is China cracking down on freedoms in Hong Kong? So I think it's great to have brought up the legal system because I think there's in a sense been too much, it's a natural thing I think in uh, the United States to focus on elections as the kind of be all definer of, of, of democracy, that we've had our own problems with maintaining that. But one of the things that we've really realized in the United States recently is how crucially important a separation of powers, the checks and balances between different modes of, um, of society is. And in Hong Kong, one of the things that always um, was striking to me was that it wasn't democratic, but if the police arrested um, protesters, the, you didn't know how the courts would handle that, whether the courts would come on the side of uh, the protesters or on the sides of the police. And that's something that I think has been very frustrating to Beijing. Uh, Beijing has an idea of one country, two systems. Hong Kong was supposed to be able to maintain a distinctive way of life for 50 years after 1997, after it became part of the PRC. It was supposed to over time become more democratic with more Hong Kong people choosing who ran them. but there's always been a tension between what the two systems mean. Does it mean a separate rule of law? Does it mean a separate, simply a different way of having economic behavior? I think what we've seen in the last year is Beijing saying very clearly that what they meant or what they would like to see is that people will spend and make money in a different way in Hong Kong than they do on the mainland, but in other regards that they will have more and more the same system. And so I think the fact that the legal system is one of the places um, where the challenges are coming as well as the electoral system and freedom of press is not surprising. It fits in with that effort to minimize the one country, two systems. So one country, 1.5 systems, 1.4 systems, and in the minds of some activists now, one point, well, just one system. Thank you so much. Natalia, this next question is for you. What is the way forward for Belarus? The country seems to be in a stalemate. People aren't prepared to tolerate Lukashenko anymore, but the attempt to unseat him has so far failed and the protests are fading away. Lukashenko seems to have no plans to step down or to seek compromise. What do you expect to happen in the near future? Well, thank you very much for this question. Um, revolutions are difficult to predict, um, but I don't think um, the protests have um, ground to a halt, as I, I hope I've, I've tried to demonstrate. Um, the point of no return has been reached, and, and I haven't had the chance to, to talk about it, um, but um, it's the violence that the state that perpetrated, and this is a, a theme that has been mentioned in, in several of the um, uh, panelist presentations, you know, the role of violence or the absence of outrageous violence like a massacre. When Belarus, that violence um, has been perpetrated. It wasn't a massacre, um, but the um, level of police violence in in uh, August was so unprecedented, and and for Belarus was so unacceptable in 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 terms of um, uh, certain you know cultural and historic intolerance to that kind of behaviour. That um, the point of no return has been reached. Um, the protests continue um, and it's impossible um, to go back to the status quo uh, for the uh, majority of the population 
for a large majority, um, as, as has been demonstrated um, by a number of polls and so on. Um, and um, uh, both the protesters and the um, authorities are now looking to spring um, for, uh, uh, because the next few months, um, possibly the next few weeks will be crucial because um, uh, the opposition leaders have designated the 25th of March as, as a date almost for return or revival of upstreet demonstrations. Um, the authorities have also clearly uh, got that date in sight and are worried about the renewal of, of uh, public protest uh, on the scale that nearly pushed them out. Um, uh, there's also another interesting development that has been happening um, and, and is reported by sociological um, research um, very late is that for the past four months um, the supporters of the regime have been defecting and have been changing sides and joining the, the protesters which is I think part of a central part of the strategy um, by Tikhanovskas um, team uh, and so on. So we need to watch that space. Um, and it, it's very difficult to imagine how um, Lukashenko can remain in power for long. Um, it, it is because, not just because, the, you know, there the, 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 the were protests, um, uh, they gave Belarusians something that they haven't experienced for a very long time. I was privileged to um, be at the first mass demonstration or a part of the first mass demonstration in, back in August. I was in Minsk. And it was just an incredible um, atmosphere. Um, it was more like a celebration. Um, people were standing tall and proud, uh, fearless, and that kind of dignity is something that once experienced, and again, proportionally, this was experienced by a large part of Belarusian society, not just in the capital, but across the country. Um, that's very difficult to give up again. And I think for, for in, in many ways, the protests have now been about fighting back for that dignity and wanting it back. Um, and I just cannot imagine how that this can, can keep ruling over a population that is basically unwilling to cooperate. Whether it's Italian strikes, protests, street demonstrations, so it's unbiable. Thank you so much. Uh, this next question, and I apologize if I mispronounce this for Claudio. Sawas di ka Claudio. Can you elaborate on the constitutional change in Thailand? Sure. Um, I mean, the original demand, they're actually, I mean, constitutional reform are undergoing. Um, so the original demand of the protest was basically um, to change the part of the constitution that referred to the composition of the parliament on one side, and then expand it to change the part of the constitution that also uh, engage with the monarchy and the, the role of the monarchy in the country. Now, the the attempt originally was to start the protest to bring and force the government to actually start discussing this in parliament. And the strategy of the government has been basically a slow down strategy of this reform. It's been to say, yes, absolutely, we will reform the constitution, uh, no problem. And then uh, to bring these questions to parliament and slow them down. And in many ways, I think what, I mean, what Jeff was talking about in terms of um, this kind of resistance to massacre, um, it's happening in Thailand as well. Uh, I think what they have learned from the Hong Kong protest is that if you kind of let them run for a while, they lose steam. Uh, and there's something that has really been part of this. So the constitutional reform is happening now in parliament extremely slowly. Uh, and that is often presented by the government say, why are you still protesting? We are considering your demand. Um, so I think that's that's kind of the strategy that is going. It's really hard to imagine a constitutional reform that really will respond to the demand of the protesters because you need an up like a 60% majority to reform the constitution and the army controls more than 60% of the of the parliament as of now. Thank you. Nina, this question's for you. Is Putin fatigue the only reason for protests in Russia? Do you think that protests will largely stop once Putin is no longer in power, or are there other sources of discontent in the Russian government which will continue after Putin's passing? This is such a utopian question. Thank you for this. Uh, we can't even imagine that Putin is not going to be in power. He has been around for 20 years. Uh, so, of course, it is the Putin fatigue. It is the system that is run by him. It's, it is a Putin system. And so that's what Navalny represents is uh, 
um, is sort of another form that is possible. Um, but not not really. I mean, I mean how does not really? I mean, Putin is the major issue in protest, especially this uh this ones right now but as i mentioned uh in in my presentation a little bit uh the protests before were about things that are not run well about things that uh you know when the elections are not happening um in terms of uh those that places like Yekaterinburg or Irkutsk or some other places would want and uh, people would just vote against the um, the United Russia the Putin's party system so I think it is it is against I mean the protests in my view are mostly right now against an ossified system in a system that you have very little maneuver uh, you either uh, belong to the state apparatus, even in, you know, even contractual forms, but still, or you have to find some other ways of living or immigrate and, and, um, um, and, and find ways to um, exist without um, kind of being part of this political system, which, get it, which is getting harder and harder. So I think we're in that state, we're in sort of the, uh, you know, you're probably, most of you are very young, you don't remember, uh, you can't remember how the end of the Soviet state was like when Brezhnev was in power for 20 years and uh, the system really was so dead inside that uh, it just had no other place by collapse. And so it feels like the Putin system is exactly at that stage. And that's why the protests that are happening right now, nothing is allowed. You really cannot. I mean, the, the, uh, the journalists are being arrested just for reporting on the protests, which really was the first thing ever happened. I mean, the first thing ever happened in recent history, I mean. Um, so the state is pushing very, very hard against any potential, um, any potential, um, uh, opposition to it. And so in this sense, uh, your question is interesting, is that it's not just against the Putin, it's against the Putin system that protests are happening. Thank you. And just as a follow up to that, um, the West and Western media portrays Putin in a very specific way, but the understanding is that he is quite popular internally. So uh, can you speak a little bit about the dichotomy between the internal uh, views of Putin and then the way that the West portrays him? Well, I mean, I, I think, I mean, in some ways actually was um, um, in, an important, Maria asked a question, you know, who, why should we care? And I would say, I mean, I'm not an opposition leader. As an opposition leader, I would say, oh, it's wonderful the West cares about what we do. We need support and whatnot. I, as a professor who teaches international affairs and also a Russian who is right now in Moscow would say, I wish the West does not care. Because in many ways, and especially for many Russians, it feels that the West has really no moral standing anymore to care about the Russian protests and you know tell people how to deal with it and go about it. And that's actually was kind of my points to Jeff uh, in 89 and 91. In 89 and 91, there was a place to look at there was all these democracies that we wanted to be. Who wants to be an American democracy right now? Uh, so I think that really makes a difference for all this. And I think Claudio mentioned that it's not the look, it's not looking West. It's kind of having a unity of your own. Um, we, we don't even need to call it democracy. We just have, you know, better freedoms in, in, in many ways. Uh, so I think that is an important uh, thing to consider. I mean, I am the way Putin is portrayed in the West. I always have, and Jeff, Jeff heard it many times. If I always say that if I weren't against Putin, I would be for him, because the way Russia is portrayed is amazing. I mean, it's despicable. It's ridiculous. It's no free journalism. It's you know, basically there is a target on on Russia head not that Russia doesn't deserve a lot of criticism but that's not criticism right now it came out uh, um, FSB you know uh, CIA whatever something just came out and said oh you know the Russians malign uh, malign the Western vaccines like great look at you you malign the Russian vaccine every single second of your time so why is it okay to for the Russians it's not okay but it's okay for the West 
So uh, in this sense, by the way, the more Russia is stressed, and I do think that it, a lot of it goes back to the Cold War um, and kind of it's, you know, hating Russia is like hating Russia is like riding bike because, you know, and we are very politically correct. Look at me. I look exactly like, like an, many Americans. So it's easy. You don't need to, one doesn't need to feel bad to write horrible things. Uh, but also, um, I think the, uh, and, and actually that helps Putin, because if Russia is villain all the time, then the Russians feel that they have to kind of rally behind the flag. He's not as popular as he was even three years ago. I think, as I said, in 2018, that became a watershed moment when elections happened and suddenly pensions went bust and whatnot. So the popularity is going down. It is a very tiring system, which is very afraid of its own um, uh, of its own collapse and and getting more restrictive by the minute. So yeah. popularity yeah. is not, but uh, the the West should stop bashing Russia because it actually helps the regime rather than uh, rather than um, undermines it. Interesting. Uh, Maria, if I can also bring you in on this topic and also comment on President Xi, kind of in the same the same light of what Nina has been commenting with uh, Putin. Um, yeah, I mean, very interesting comments, Nina. I don't think the West is going to stop bashing either <laughs> Russia or China for that matter. It's just it's just part of the it's part yeah. of the discourse. Uh, when it comes to China, we see this narrative going across party lines. It's no longer just a Republican issue. It's everyone pretty much is on board with an anti-China sentiment. So I think that's not something that's going to stop anytime soon. But it does also, similarly to Russia, help create a certain kind of villain um, out of China. And of course, during this uh, recent months and uh, post-pandemic, uh, Xi Jinping and his one-party system has actually gotten stronger domestically, I think, rather than weaker, in, in large part because it came off as stronger vis-a-vis -vis the West. So the West is used as the kind of the other, in this case, to compare China against. And the U.S. failure with dealing with the crisis, the pandemic, and the vaccine distribution now, and China's efficiency in, in comparison looks uh, quite, you know, admirable to domestic publics. And then in addition to that, the, the kind of the establishment, um, the foreign policy establishment in China is becoming more vocal in speaking against the bashing narrative. So they push back and they speak against it in some ways, I think learning from the motives of Russian PR, uh, RT, and just kind of the propaganda techniques that are much more aggressive. So in a sense, we kind of see the similar, I think, patterns um, in both of the systems, but I, I don't think the Western narratives are going to change. So if anything, we'll see, I think, more of that rather than less, even though I agree it's often counterproductive and it doesn't help people who are actually on the ground um, trying to achieve change or accomplish certain results. It doesn't always, um, it doesn't always get there. And actually, if, there, if we do have time, I would love to also hear from Natalia whether she thinks that Western critiques and kind of interference into the Belarus case is helpful, because I've heard this a lot on social media, that we should be doing something, we should be doing more, we should be more vocal. And I'm curious whether you think we have done anything. And if, if so, you know, who is we? Does the West actually help? I'm, I'm wondering about that myself as I read all this, you know, discussions about Belarus. So thanks for this. Um, thank you very much. Yes, it, it's, a, it's a crucial question of, of which role uh, um, the West should play, you know, and, and, and should it play a role at all. Um, and in Belarus, um, it, it's a, a kind of painful but also interesting question because on the one hand, of course, uh, you know, uh, for, for the protest, uh, uh, for the protest, uh, protest movement, sorry, um, uh, the so expressions of solidarity, support, sympathy even uh, from outside and, and particularly from the West are, are very important. Um, it, it is, a, it gives Belarusians the feeling that the world cares. Um, it matters not just to us, um, but also to someone else. And, uh, but at the same time, um, the opposition uh, leadership have been very, very careful to reassure Russia uh, of uh, its intentions of loyalty and uh, continued partnership and good relations with Russia. And this only chimes with um, the popular mood in Belarus. Um, this isn't just a strategic uh, gimmick. Um, it does reflect the uh, pro-Russian sympathies that remain there despite the recent events um, and, uh, you know, Putin's lukewarm but uh, nevertheless support for um, Lukashenko. Um, and, and so there have been, you know, um, voices saying, look, don't put Belarus in the middle. Um, uh, you know, it, it's fine to help, uh, but perhaps do it in cooperation with Russia. 
of course, following the um, uh, pro Navalny protests, that cooperation with Russia has become very difficult for the West, even more so than before, perhaps. Thank but you. I think, um, I again, you know, I, mean, I just want to get a couple more questions in because we're almost near the end. I'm sorry. Um, Claudio, if I can direct this question to you, I'm sorry. Could you elaborate a bit more about why the protests in Thailand are different from the protests in Russia, Hong Kong, and Belarus? Do you anticipate the Thailand protests to become more severe in the immediate future? I mean, um, first of all, I'm not an expert on Russia and Belarus, so um, <laughs> it's hard to do a comparison when you kind of know a part of the comparison. Um, but I think, um, I mean, I think the point I was making there is that there, there's a there's a sort of difference, I think, in relation to parliamentarian forces and the idea of a government emerging, right? And and that is like part of the history actually of this protest in Thailand, which are don't start this year, but they are you know another phase of something that happened more um, more clearly in 2010. And during that time, those protests really kind of, at least at the beginning, had the sort of hero in charge. He had someone that they wanted back in power, uh, which was Taksin at the moment. And I think what the, what the protests have learned, and maybe that will happen in Russia and Belarus as, as well, uh, is that that kind of idea of the saving hero, this idea that Nina was referring to as this other Russian hero, uh, ended up limiting the, the ability of the protest to do things, to think about possibility, to organize. And the repression that happened after the 2014 military coup really showed that having a protest with such clear structure of leadership was really unproductive and extremely dangerous. Because by taking out a few leaders, you would destroy a mass movement. And that's precisely what has happened um, after the coup with five, 600 well-pointed and well-planted arrest, a movement of millions of people uh, was uh, brought to a halt. Now the halt, as Natalia was saying, wasn't a halt of disappearance. People were organizing locally, there were reading groups, there were people doing things. Uh, movement don't die, they, they just kind of go, go quiet for a while. Um, I think what is happening right now in Thailand, it's it's a conflict in a way that kind of um, rehashed some of the conflict that Jeff was talking about in the Hong Kong case, a question about what kind of techniques are acceptable in this moment. And there's a part of the movement who thinks that more frontal confrontation with the police and the army forces is actually fine. And a part of the movement that keep repeating that nonviolence is absolutely central to the project. Now. Um, we don't have an answer for this, and I don't think um, I don't think that the like usual celebration of of nonviolence is necessarily um, the way to go in some of these environments. But I think that conflict has emerged at the same time. A less majesty, which wasn't used in the last couple of years, has been brought back really harshly in the last months. So now you have a bunch of people going up for trial for 30, 40, 50 years of jail. Um, a protest movement that is still in the street, but kind of growing in a certain section willingness to, to do violence or to be involved in violent protest and a pushback from the other side. So my sense is that we will see um, a fracture probably inside the protest body and more protest happening, but maybe not as unified as it's been so far. Thank you so much. I know we're near the end of the hour. So Maria, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Thank you to all of uh, our panelists for a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for to everyone for participating. It's been an honor to listen to all of your remarks. I've learned a lot and I think there are many converging but also divergent things emerging from this conversation. And one thing I guess I didn't bring up at the beginning, but it's really rare to see conversation between scholars who are working on Asia and also Eastern Europe and Russia. I think those are not uh, you know the fields that come come together very 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 frequently these days unlike you know the the era of 1989 and before as jeff mentioned where we had these conversations we no longer have them so i think it's a really great chance to reconnect as well and to to build new um alliances in this research and on this topic so i look forward to you know to speaking again to maybe organizing future panels and to learning from everyone so thank you very much for the remarks and for sticking to the time and um, thank you to la um world affairs council for organizing this event and for hosting Thank you very much.
Thank you to such an expert panel. This is so timely and so important. We have to have you all back. This is a continuing conversation. So thank you. And Maria, terrific job moderating today. Thank you so much. We appreciate all of your time uh, and expertise. And we all learned so much today. Thank you.